On behalf of Graham and uh, the session, I would extend a warm welcome to you all this morning. And um, I notice we have uh, uh, some extra visitors today, and uh, we, wel we welcome you. And um, uh, in the uh, in the announcements, uh, uh, remember we had a, a closing. Um, an offering for the uh, Christmas Bowl Appeal. Well, for your information, we received $450 for that, which was exceedingly good uh, for the, uh, the congregation. And um, uh, next, w next week, Graham will be um, uh, commencing uh, uh, the services next year. So uh, we will welcome you all uh, to return next year uh, as we uh, continue uh, worshipping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, as uh, if you've read the notices, you'll find that the offering will be received as a, uh, as a retiring offering after the service, and uh, I won't need to announce that further. So, uh, and uh, with that, I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you, Keith. It's lovely to be with you this morning. Shall we begin our service by uniting in prayer? Let us pray together. Almighty God, we come to you with grateful hearts that you came in the person of Jesus to be with us and that you are for us. We thank you for that baby born all those years ago. We know that it has changed history forever. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love and his mercy and his kindness, for his vision and his purpose. We thank you that he came to usher in your kingdom and we yearn for that kingdom. We're concerned about so many places in the world where things are not as they should be. And as the truth must be told, we recognize that it's even within ourselves, not always as it should be. So we come to you for mercy and forgiveness and to be gathered as your children, to hear the voice of the King of Kings as we open the scriptures and listen again to the joy that Mary found as she expressed her delight to her cousin Elizabeth. We ask your blessing on this service and upon all who worship you today. May we have a great sense that we are part of that great community of people around the world who lift up the name of Jesus. Hear our prayer and help us for his name's sake. Amen. Well, our opening hymn is uh, a carol, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's one of John Wesley's uh, many, Charles Wesley, I beg your pardon, one of Charles Wesley's many hymns. Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
Thank you. Please be seated. Christine's going to bring us young at heart this morning. It's not on the order of service. It's just a bonus for you being here. Well, the reason it's not on the order of service is I really had no idea that came to mind and so much else in my mind. So Graham said, well, he wouldn't put it on the order of service, so I wouldn't feel under pressure to come up with something. And then um, yesterday afternoon, I realised that what I could talk about had been staring in me in the face for a few weeks. Earlier this year, I read about the book called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And immediately I thought it would be a good Christmas present for two of our grandsons. Most of you know we have 16 grandchildren and um, it's quite a challenge thinking of suitable presents and quite a few got vouchers this year. Anyway, but I thought this is a great story. It's based on a true story, um, as the best stories are. And um, I thought it would suit these two grandsons and also, yeah, and hopefully inspire them. When I was planning today's talk, I discovered that I really am way behind because it has been made into a film and is streaming on Netflix. Has anyone seen it, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind? Not yet. You have, right. It, yeah. Now, what I'm going to read is mostly from Wikipedia, um, just changed a bit by me to make it more lively. That is the cover of the book, and apparently there is a version for even younger children. Now, the boy in the title is William Kamkwamba from Malawi. He's a young schoolboy, when the story begins, growing up in a family of farmers in the village of Wimbe. And I'm sorry, I don't know where in Malawi that actually is. He dabbles in fixing radios for his friends and neighbours and spends his free time looking through the local junkyard for salvageable electrical, electronic components. I thought that was pretty fantastic in a village in Malawi. Um, he is sadly banned from attending school because his parents become unable to pay his tuition fees. So being passionate about education, it's, you know, a salutary reminder that it's not available for everyone. Now, the little bit of romance in this story is that William's former science teacher is the boyfriend of William's sister. But that relationship is kept secret for reasons I don't know. So William actually blackmails his, well, it's called blackmail in Wikipedia. He threatens to divulge this secret to his parents unless his science teacher allows him to keep coming to class. Pretty resourceful. So he's allowed to attend the science class and he can also, very importantly, access the school's library where he learns about electrical engineering and energy production. So he's a bright kid. By the mid-2000s, well, it couldn't be the mid-2000s, I think it should be the mid-2010s, maybe, failing crops because of drought have devastated Williams Village. So there are riots over the government rationing and because William's family are robbed of their very depleted grain stores. People soon begin abandoning, abandoning the village and William's sister elopes with the science teacher saying this will be one less person for her family to feed. 
William wants to save his village from the drought. So he devises a plan to build a windmill, hence the title of the book. He plans to build this windmill to power an electric water pump that he had scavenged earlier from the dump or the tip. William builds a small prototype, a small, sorry, proof of concept prototype, which works, but it's too small to be of any real use. To build a larger one like the one in the picture, he needs his father's permission to dismantle the family bike to get the spare parts he needs. His father's name is Triwell in English. I'm not sure whether that is an African name or someone's actually called him Triwell because he's a hard worker. Anyway. The family bike is the only bike in the village and the last asset the family owns. His father thinks this is all a piece of nonsense and destroys the prototype and tells William, you're working in the fields as a farmer's boy. Then William's dog dies of starvation and for some reason around this time, William's mother decides to have a talk to her husband, his father. William and his father reconcile after William buries the dog and his father allows him to dismantle the bike and with the help of his friends and the few people who have not fled the village, they build a full-size wind turbine which leads to a successful crop. Word of William's windmill spreads, hence the book, hence the Netflix, and he's awarded a scholarship so he can have a full education. And he eventually receives a, a degree from Dartmouth College, which I somehow thought was in Dartmouth, Dartmouth England, but it's not. It's an Ivy League college about what's William's done since. But I, I thought, I found it inspiring. I had such an easy run through st state schools in, you know, in Scotland with no fees, great teachers, supportive parents, excellent lecturers at uni. And I just love it when I hear about people who've, who've had such a different run but made it. But I think there's other things we can learn apart from appreciating our own e education. And this is for the adults. We must be careful never to reject out of hand the suggestions of our young people. Even if in the end we discover they're not feasible, we owe them the respect. We owe the young people the respect of considering them. And to the two youngest people amongst us, don't be discouraged if at first people don't like your ideas. Young and old can learn from one another. I think too the role of his mother is significant. She obviously didn't like this breakdown between her son and her husband. She helped sort of organize a reconciliation or facilitate a reconciliation and look at the result. In Paul's letter to Timothy, he writes, to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. At the same time, he said in his letter to Titus, urge the young men to be sensible. Once William's father was persuaded that the idea was right. He gave it his support and they went ahead with great success. So I believe that this story has something to teach all of us who are young enough at heart to still be willing to learn no matter how old 
we are in years. May God bless us all. Thank you, Christine, for that proto-revolutionary story. Now to invite you back to read the Bible to us. And I'm reading from the message, which I'm not used to in this dim section of the church. Is it dim because of the problem of shadows? Okay, I can just read this small print. And Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all the others. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength, scattered the bluffing braggarts, He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised beginning with Abraham and right up to now. May God bless this word to us. Yes, indeed. We're going to sing again. This time the carol is the first Noel, traditional carol. And uh, we're good to go.
you feel there could have been more verses and more verses to that because the, the whole story is being told. Actually, the wise men don't arrive uh, traditionally till Epiphany, which is the 6th of January. So I'll possibly pick up on that as we start the new year. Uh, I thought that might be uh, given that uh, the next service is on the 3rd of January. Today, however, I want to go back uh, to Mary's song, which Christine read. And uh, I've used the same image that I used on Christmas morning by Corey Eisenbacher. And I hope that uh, this will serve to remind us not only of the joy that uh, the Elizabeth and Mary shared, but I want to pick up on the second part of Mary's uh, song. And uh, I've called it His Mercy Flows. His Mercy Flows. So today we're going to think about uh, the second half of the, of the uh, song of Mary and we're going to look at a number of different things. And I want to connect it with five ideas. And when I put the headings on the screen, you might say, what is that? What's that got to do with Mary's song? And you just have to trust me <laughs> that I think I know what I'm talking about. Firstly, I want to say, everything is broken. That might ring a bell with some of you, especially those of you who Remember Bob Dylan embraced Christianity in 1978. Everything is broken. Then I want to think about, you say you want a revolution. That goes back beyond 78 to 68. That's the title of a Beatles song, Revolution. You say you want a revolution. We all want to change the world. And then the third thing is Chairman Mao. Now, how did Chairman Mao get into Mary's song. In my thinking, I want to take you to a revolution. And then I want to talk about a corona of thorns. Remember that corona is the Greek word for a crown. All right, so corona of thorns. We've been singing about a king. We've been thinking about it in our reflections uh, many times. And I want to pick that up. And then I want to talk to you a little personal story about a little drummer boy that came to me yesterday and uh, deeply moved me for reasons which I hope to explain. So first of all, everything is broken. Bob Dylan has a song and it's called Everything is Broken. Broken bodies, broken bones, broken voices, broken phones, broken bodies, broken voices on broken bones, broken treaties, broken vows, broken pipes, broken tools. People bending broken rules. He goes on and on as he so easily does. And it's, it's as if he suddenly started to see that the world is full of problematic issues. There's a lot of brokenness in human experience. And this was true in Israel. It's not a new phenomenon. It's not something that we've just invented. It didn't come with the atom bomb. It didn't come with the bullet and the gun didn't come with swords and arrows. It came with the human heart. It's part of the package that we pass on. It's part of what we are. And it's here in the Old Testament. Israel had broken their, their covenant with God. God had said, Abraham, through you I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth. And here is the deal. Uh, you follow me and uh, I will bless you and be with you. And Abraham and his descendants found this difficult. And by Moses' time, the, the whole nation wanted to be freed. And God chose to free them from Egypt, where they had been made slaves. And the covenant was renewed. And there were blessings that would follow. But there were problems if they failed, to, failed in their faithfulness to the covenant. And Israel's broken faith ended the relationship with Yahweh, their Lord. And they had embraced the gods of their neighbors, the, God, the pagan gods of the ancient world. The Baals and the Asherahs, and you'll find them enumerated there. Molech, they even offered their children as sacrifices to Molech. So the curses of Deuteronomy 31 came down on the people. And then the temple of God was pillaged and destroyed, and the people themselves were taken into captivity. And the land of milk and honey, the promised land, lay bare and desolate. The people were back in Babylon. And the message of Jeremiah was to seek the welfare of the city where you are. 
that will be the best outcome at this stage. And uh, in, uh, it was in 586. They were in Babylon for years. Some of them never left Babylon. Those who eventually returned from Babylon to Judah experienced a succession of tyrannical overlords. Babylon was followed by the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. And through all these years, the Hebrew prophets, in their scriptures, in their poetry, even in their drama, read Jeremiah and you'll see how he had to act out his prophecy. Even in their drama and the names they gave their children. Even in all of that, their culture was saturated with the idea that God would come back, that God would restore them, that there was hope, that God was rich in mercy, that God would send a deliverer, that there was a change coming. And the hopes and the prayers and the dreams of the people were informed by that. And so we've come to Elizabeth and uh, with Zechariah and Mary with Joseph, living at different ends of the country, but brought together by the census that required that they be at Bethlehem. And God uh, wants us, Luke in particular, in writing his gospel, has presented us with these two women, uh, shared an ancient dream, the dream of the prophets, which uh, they believed would come true, and that Mary had insight into now, which was new and revolutionary, that the world would be blessed through the family of Abraham and Sarah. Mary had been told and believed every word. Uh, and as she shared the news with Mary that the promised Messiah was to be born, and that the angel had said, in some way that Mary could barely begin to imagine, I suppose, that he would be called the Son of God. And that he would be great. And that he would inherit the kingdom of his father David, his ancestor David. And as she shared this, the joy of the two women overflowed. And uh, it's reported that the, the, uh, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy. There was a kind of, I just imagine it as, I don't know if you watched Call the Midwife last night. But that moment when a child can be felt and felt as active in the uterus. So the child skipped in her womb. Now what changes were the women imagining? What were they envisaging would happen? Well, it made me think about the Beatles' 1968 song, Revolution. You say you want a revolution. Well, you know, we all want to change the world. You tell me that it's evolution. Well, you know... We all want to change the world. But if you go on carrying pictures of Chairman Mao, you ain't going to make it anyhow. Well, the Beatles lived uh, in an extraordinary life. There's no doubt about that. Lennon and McCartney became the uh, best-selling singer-songwriters ever. Nobody has sold more songs than they, than they put together. Maybe we may not like their songs as much as some other people's songs, but that's by the point, by the, by the way. So there was under enormous pressure to, uh, to pursue kind of revolution. As their wealth and power grew from the early 60s to the late 60s, there were groups wanting change, and Chairman Mao was, was becoming a, a bit of an icon in the East, and he was pushing the little red book and the thoughts of Chairman Mao, and China was becoming an international power once again, as it had been hundreds of years before. And so the question was, what was happening in China? Well, recently I've been reading a book about it. And the revolution that was taking place there uh, was perhaps not as, as uh, rosy as it was being presented in the, in the West. I was given this book. 15 years ago, can you imagine? And I started reading it in the lockdown. I love the fact that it's about Chairman Mao and it's called The Unknown Story. I love the fact that the picture of Chairman Mao on the front is tiny. It's as if the publishers are trying to present him kind of like a real person, not just like an icon. And this book, if, if it's only half true, is just astonishing 
It presents a story of the, the leader of the Chinese Communist Revolution as a man who was not concerned with the ordinary people. I imagined, knowing for example that Frederick Engels in England, a German man in England, was concerned about the plight of the Irish mill workers and he wanted a better deal for the mill workers. He saw they needed change and he talked to his friend Karl Marx about this. But Mao had no concern at all. And uh, this is how this book begins. I haven't finished it yet. Mao Tse Tung, who for decades held absolute power over the lives of one quarter of the world's population, was responsible for well over 70 million deaths in peacetime, more than any other 20th century leader. More than 70 million deaths to bring about his revolution. How do we measure a revolution? Well, that book was written by uh, uh, <laughs> Jung Chang, who wrote a book called Wild Swans. It was a popular book about 20 years ago, I guess. And I, I've also got that book on the shelf because Christine got it and read it, and we passed it around a few people, but I haven't read that one either. But this author grew up in China in the 1960s in the Cultural Revolution. And she writes the story in Wild Swans of her experience and her mother's experience and her grandmother's experience as three generations of Chinese women growing up under the same time that this book, Chairman Ma, was, in, was rising to power. So the violence and terror that Mao inflicted on his own people was horrific. And if it's half true, uh, it's still truly terrifying. A man who had no real care for his citizens of his country so what kind of revolution was Mary envisaging? Well, perhaps all of us have a touch of this. The nations to be blessed, that the powers that kept the world in slavery had to be toppled. Nobody would normally thank God for blessing if they were poor, hungry, enslaved or miserable. God would have to win victory over bullies, the power brokers, the forces of evil, which people like Mary and Elizabeth knew all too well, living as they did in the dark days of Herod the Great, whose casual brutality was backed up with the threat of Rome. And as they read their scriptures and soaked themselves in the Psalms, they read of mercy, they read of hope, they read of fulfillment of prophecies and the reversal, and they read of revolution, of victory over evil, and God coming to rescue at last, God turning the world right around. All of this is packed into Mary's joyful song. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen Israel, through which he's going to bring blessing to all the nations. God's mercy would reach the poor and the oppressed. Mary had the God news. But Chairman Mao is a reality in our world. This is the revolution that uh, he pursues uh, brings about pain and tyranny. And pain and tyranny are not unique to Chairman Mao. They, they come again and again wherever people seek power for their own interests. And, and in our prayers this morning we will remember the fact that uh, Syria as a nation is, lies in ruins that Lebanon, we won't mention all these places, but the Lebanon itself has been devastated with millions of Syrian refugees and uh, uh, an economy that doesn't work anymore, that Europe is struggling with the refugees that are seeking a better life there, that uh, America is struggling with COVID, and, uh, and there are so many issues right around the world. So we need to think ourselves... The, the themes that Mary is interested in in her song, later on, they're echoed in the teaching of uh, John and Jesus. Hang on. Elizabeth's son, John, was beheaded by Herod at the, at the whim of the Herod dynasty. And Jesus, Mary's son, the child she's carrying in, at this moment, uh, the, although he was declared innocent by Pontius Pilate, the Roman administrator, suffered uh, torture and death on a Roman cross. The God news to Mary comes with unexpectedly dark undertones. When Jesus is a baby, 
Mary is told that sorrow, like a sharp sword, will pierce her own soul. Luke chapter 2. When he is 12 years old, she will lose him for three days at Passover. And if you've ever lost a child, even for an hour, you know how, ang- how anxiety builds. You remember that story that the group had come to, to Jerusalem for the Passover and they were on their way back north again to the Galilee and they discovered that Jesus wasn't with the group, children in the group and they went back and they looked for him and they searched. What anxiety must have been theirs? Something that most parents would be relate to, I think. And then when Jesus is 30, she wonders if he's gone mad. You remember that? The family were distressed about him. Mark tells about it in chapter 3. She will despair for him completely for a further three days in Jerusalem as the God she now wildly celebrates in her song seems to have deceived her. That brings us to the crown of thorns. Mary's son will indeed be king, but his crown isn't a golden crown. It's a crown of thorns. And this makes us think again. It is time to think about this. Luke tells us that Jesus' lament over Jerusalem, rejecting the Prince of Peace, means that the nation will reap a different harvest. If the people reject him and his kingdom, then they will suffer. In, in uh, Jesus died around the year 30, 33, uh, and in the year 66, The first Jewish Roman war began. In the year 70, Rome overwhelmed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Romans continued to fight against the the Jews and vice versa. And uh, if you go to to Rome, you'll see in the uh, great arch of of Titus uh, an image of Roman soldiers carrying the menorah, the golden menorah from the temple in Jerusalem in the triumphant festival back in Rome. In putting down the Bar Kokhba revolt in the year 132, villages, uh, 985 Judean villages were destroyed and the population of central Judea was essentially wiped out, killed, sold into slavery or forced to flee. Yes, Mary's song comes 30 weeks before Christmas and it comes 30 years before Calvary and Easter. Mary's child comes with a different kind of revolution. Comes with the revolution that the the women learn from their psalms and from their prophets. If we look at Psalm 72 for a moment. And I'll read it in this version, which is... Remember, this is the last of the psalms of David. It's David praying for his, his son who will be the new king. But he goes way beyond Solomon. And it says this, May the king judge the poor fairly. May he help the needy and defeat their oppressors. May the king be like rain on the fields, like showers falling on the land. May righteousness flourish in his lifetime and may prosperity last as long as the moon gives light. Long live the king. He rescues the poor who call to him and those who are needy and neglected. He has pity on the weak and the poor. He saves the lives of those in need. He rescues them from their oppression and violence and gives, and their lives are precious in his sight. Just a few segments from that psalm. And this is great David's greatest son. This is the king that was promised. This is the king that uh, Mary was celebrating in her song. These were the hopes she had. She'd seen it in the godly women of the past. She'd seen it in Hannah's song. She knew what was right and that right would triumph. But she didn't know at what cost the king would come. 2,000 years after his execution, people are still following the crucified saviour and finding new life in him. In countries around the world, there are governments actively trying to stop the spread of the Christian faith. Every day there are accounts of people who would rather die than deny him. And many die. These people have discovered in Mary's child the Saviour who brings life and love and purpose to living and hope to dying. A poem written for Christmas. It's called The Poem and the Song for Christmas Day by 
uh, English poet, uh, Malcolm Gate, contains these verses. He's talking about the old pagan gods. They sought to soar into the skies, those classic gods of high renown, for lofty pride aspires to rise, but you came down. Where chiseled marble seems to freeze their abstract and perfected form, compassion brought you to your knees. Your blood was warm. They towered above our mortal plane, dismissed this restless flesh with scorn, aloof from birth and death and pain. But you were born. Born to these burdens, born by all. Born with us all astride the grave, weak to be with us when we fall, and strong to save. In a gentler vein, the revolution takes kind and kindly dimensions. One instance, for example, was that 19, in 1971, when the Beatles and Mao and all of the music that I was have alluded, read, led here, alluded to was happening. At Christmas Day that year, Bill Cruz, a minister, sat down with a plate of sandwiches in a church in uh, uh, Sydney's King's Cross and he waited. He put up a notice inviting people to come and have Christmas lunch with him. It would be a humble lunch, but he would share it. And eventually some people started to come in. Bill Cruz, he shared a lunch of sandwiches. Today, Bill's lunch in Sydney's inner west is the biggest in Sydney, and it hosts around 2,000 people each year, though this year, of course, it's takeaway only. So the kingdom that Jesus brings is at his cost, and it has a gentler dimension, and it picks up the needy and the, those who are hurting and invi invites us. Now... As I thought about this yesterday, I was at my desk and my phone rang. I think I can't, maybe I rang my brother or I can't remember which way it was. But he, he, I was supposed to see him catch up with him. And uh, I've got three brothers, but uh, Jamie rang and he's thick with the cold. He'd had a COVID test, didn't have COVID, so he's all right. So. We, but on balance, we decided we wouldn't meet up yesterday. It was his birthday, but we wouldn't meet up. And he said, hey, Gray, you know how you have those restless nights with, filled with dreams when you don't feel well? Yeah, yeah, I know that. He said, well, I had one of those last night. And he said, you know, you can only remember the last scene in your dream. This is the one just before you wake up. He said, well, I, I remember the last scene in my dream. I said, what was it, Jamie? He said, well... We were all together, you know, the brothers and the families, all around a Christmas table. And our families were standing about this laden table, waiting for the call to sit down or for someone to say grace. And at that point, our father, Garth Bradbeer, who died on Christmas Day 37 years ago, started to sing. And this is what he sang. He sang, Come. They told me pa ra pa pum pum ra pa pum pum a newborn king to see pa ra pa pum pum ra pa pum pum And I'm thinking about the king who's come. And here's my brother, not a practicing believer. Not a believer. But he's got this strange dream about our dad. And instead of saying grace, like my dad used to always say grace, the same grace for these and all thy mercies, Lord, we are truly thankful. Dad used to always say that grace. But this time in Jamie's dream, he sings a little drummer boy and he sings about the newborn king, born the day my father died 2,000 years ago. Well, so I present to you the question about this king. Could he be your king? Could he be leading you into your future? Are you open to the things he says and does? To the kindliness, to the fruit of his spirit, 
that will generate uh, a new way of looking at life if you, if you make yourself open to him and receive him into your life today. It's my prayer that every one of us will receive the Lord Jesus as our Savior and we'll go into our future tuned in to the voice of the King, the gentle King who paid the price and who invites us to bring about his kingdom in the world. Amen. Now I, I did um, write out some prayers. I'm, those of you who are regular know that I often don't. Uh, before COVID I didn't write out prayers. And for, but I have written it out again today. And uh, I may not continue to do this because I like the opportunity to share about concerns for prayer. And there are one or two I will modify these prayers as I go through them a little bit. But please stay with us and we'll spend a few moments now in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we turn from the pagan gods of our age, from money, sex and war, and their companions who towered above our mortal plane Dismiss this restless flesh with scorn, aloof from birth and death and pain, to you, for you were born. With myriad angels and untold millions around the globe and throughout time, who inhabit this restless flesh, we worship you, our Saviour and King. Guide us by your Holy Spirit, to commit ourselves each day to the concerns of your kingdom, forgive our earthly conceit and vain glory, and shape our lives as your devoted servants, so that the fruit of your Spirit might increasingly be seen in our lives. Thank you that in Australia this year, at great cost and effort, we have uh, been educated and protected from COVID-19 continue to sustain our communities in their health and hygiene practices throughout their challenging summertime. Thinking especially today of the Sydney cluster and people in hotel quarantine, people who are fearful. Keep us from selfishness and greed when resources are scarce. Make us generous, cheerful givers who show our love and practical care for those in need. We know the Lord will provide Remind us each day that it may be through us that your provision will reach the needy. Protect the elderly. We pray especially for Irene's dad and mum, whose life has suddenly become more vulnerable as a result of his Stephen's fall this week. We ask your blessing on them right now. And we pray that all elderly will be kept safe. And as they receive visits from family and friends over Christmas and holiday, may the arrival of loved ones evoke memories of your advent. We ask that the vaccines which have been developed will bring protection around the globe to poor and rich nations alike. We pray for those who have experienced trauma and loss as a result of evil perpetrated by individuals or corrupt regimes. We remember that there is armed conflict in Ethiopia and Tigray, that Syria is in ruins, that the world is awash with refugees, that Christians are persecuted in China, to which we have referred in our service, and that churches have been torn down. We pray that your love and mercy will reach all such Reign in the hearts and minds of people everywhere. Advance the cause of your kingdom. Strengthen the work of all who live as servants of the cross. Wherever there is cruelty, bring kindness. Wherever there is oppression, bring liberty. Use the elections in Niger and the bombing in Nashville and innumerable other circumstances to advance your kingdom in ways we cannot understand or anticipate. May your kingdom come among us. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number, well, it doesn't really matter what number it is, but it's 177 in Rejoice. And it's by Philip Doddridge. Hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes. Thank you, Benny. Is it? Oh, it's number 40. Number 40 in the, the RCH, is that correct? Of the making of hymn books, there is no hymn. Now may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one triune God, rest upon you and remain with you and with those whom you love, now and always. Amen. should perhaps say that it's a good idea not to congregate in the doorway. Uh, Christina will open the door and we'll let air, as much air as we can, flow through the place. By all means, keep, us, keep an appropriate distance and chat to people you love to chat to and catch up as best you can. <laughs>